But what I'm going to do, and I know you're not supposed to apologize any time you start speaking for what you're going to say, but I know that even you, whose calling it is to keep the rest of us, if possible, on the right path, in these days of cynicism, in these days when there are people that in the guise of separating church and state would go so far as to say we should not even have chaplains in the military service, I, I know that there are times when all of us wonder whether we're being effective. And tonight I'd like to share an account that I received that shows how God works in our lives even in the darkest of towers. This report concerns the Marines in Beirut, brave men who believed that the goal we sought in that place was worthy of their best and gave their best. In the end, hatred centuries old made it impossible for Lebanon to achieve peace when we and so many others hoped it would. But while they were there, those young men of ours prevented widespread killing in Beirut, and they added luster, not tarnish, to their motto, Semper Fidelis. I'm going to read to you another man's words, and they're words that perhaps answer what I said a moment ago about whether we sometimes were shaken in our faith and in our, in our beliefs. On that October day, when a terrorist truck bomb took the lives of 241 Marines, soldiers, and sailors at the airport in Beirut, one of the first to reach the tragic scene was a chaplain, the chaplain of our 6th Fleet, Rabbi Arnold E. Reznikov. And here is what he finally felt urged at the end of that day to put down in writing of the experiences of that day. He said, I, along with Lieutenant Commander George Pooch Pucciarelli, the Catholic chaplain attached to the Marine unit, faced a scene almost too horrible to describe. Bodies and pieces of bodies were everywhere. Screams of those injured or trapped were barely audible at first as our minds struggled to grasp with the reality before us. A massive four-story building reduced to a pile of rubble, dust mixing with smoke and fire obscuring, obscuring our view of the little that was left. Because we'd thought that the sound of the explosion was still related to a single rocket or shell, most of the Marines had run toward the foxholes and bunkers, while we, the chaplains, had gone to the scene of the noise, just in case someone had been wounded. Now, as the news spread quickly throughout the camp, news of the magnitude of the tragedy, news of the need for others to run to the aid of those comrades who still might be alive, Marines came from all directions. There was a sense of God's presence that day in the small miracles of life which we encountered in each body that despite all odds still had a breath within. But there was more of his presence, more to keep our faith alive in the heroism and in the humanity of the men who responded to the cries for help. We saw Marines risk their own lives again and again as they went into the smoke and the fire to try to pull someone out, or as they worked to uncover friends, all the while knowing that further collapse of huge pieces of concrete precariously perched like dominoes could easily crush the rescuers. There was humanity at its best that day. Not a and a reminder not to give up the hope and dreams of what the world could be in the tears that could still be shed by these men, regardless of how cynical they had pretended to be before, regardless of how much they might have seen before. Certain images will stay with me always, he writes. I remember a Marine who found a wad of money amidst the rubble. He held it at arm's length as if it were dirty and cried out for a match or a lighter so that it could be burned. No one that day wanted to profit from the suffering of catastrophe. Later, the chaplains would put the word out that the money should be collected and given to us, for we were sure that a fund for widows and orphans would ultimately be established. But at that moment, 
I was hypnotized with the rest of the men and watched as the money was burned. Working with the wounded, sometimes comforting, simply letting them know help was on the way, sometimes trying to pull and carry those whose injuries appeared less dangerous in an immediate sense than the approaching fire or the smothering smoke. My kippa was lost. That is the little headgear that is worn by rabbis. The last I remember it, I'd used it to mop someone's brow. Father Pucciarelli, the Catholic chaplain, cut a circle out of his cap, a piece of camouflage cloth which would become my temporary head covering. Somehow he wanted those Marines to know not just that we were chaplains, but that he was a Christian and that I was Jewish. Somehow we both wanted to shout the message in a land where people were killing each other, at least partially based on the differences in religion among them, that we, we Americans, still believe that we could be proud of our particular religions and yet work side by side when the time came to help others to comfort and to ease pain. Well, you can file, file this next story under the category of whatever happened to. And in this case, the subject is a basketball player from Baltimore who exploded onto the scene when he got the nickname Jewish Jordan. He never lived up to that legendary name, but 10 years later, Jewish Jordan is still playing ball, and he resurfaced here in South Florida last week. Faith, family, and a wicked jump shot. He's one of the best all-around players, in my opinion, in the country. I look for Tamir to be a major, major player in college. Tamir Goodman is a good basketball player. But as soon as Sports Illustrated dubbed him the Jewish Jordan at age 16, good would not be good enough. My life did change overnight, you know. Everywhere I went, everyone started knowing who I was. And obviously, I don't think it's fair to be compared to him in any way because he was the greatest. Oh, what a hole by Jordan! It's not like Goodman was the first Jewish kid who could play ball, but he was the first to wear his religion on his head. You see, Goodman is orthodox, which means he always sports a yarmulke. It also means he's not allowed to play on the Sabbath, from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. That limitation forced Goodman to pass up on a scholarship from Maryland. Instead, he went to Towson, a smaller Division I school where the coach was willing to work around his schedule. And as a freshman, that skinny redhead, who used to be called Howdy Doody, proved he could play with the big boys. But just one year later, his coach left, and he and the new coach didn't get along. So Tamir left Towson to play professionally in Israel. In college, it was so hard to always, you know, snatch kosher food. My mother meeting us at the airport in the middle of the night, kosher food here, kosher food there, walking. Shabbat, leaving team buses, not staying with the team in the hotel. And so definitely a lot more convenient in Israel. Believe it or not, even in Israel, Goodman was the first Orthodox Jew to play pro basketball. So the same thing that happened in Baltimore happened in Israel. He developed a following. The guys are coming over to him on the street and they're telling him, Tamir, you're not, you're not shooting the ball well. You have to shoot like this to not like this. Tamir's brother is a rabbi in Cooper City, not too far from the Aventura office of Tamir's new team, the Haifa Heat. And that's why Goodman was in South Florida last week, promoting the team and meeting with kids who, quite literally, look up to him. The second he stepped on the court, the kids' mouths were like, oh my gosh. They're like, wow, this is amazing. You could be Jewish, and you could be a professional basketball player. If you were one of those who heard about Jewish Jordan 10 years ago, you might consider what he's doing now disappointing. But Goodman says not only does that not bother him, 
He's not even curious what might have been if not for his religion. I cannot possibly be any happier, any more blessed with the way my life has turned out. I mean, I'm blessed with a beautiful family of my own. Thank God I'm playing professional basketball in Israel. I'm able to inspire thousands of kids. It's been great. Kids got amazing convictions to be able to pass up potential wow. fame in college basketball for his religion. Got to respect what that. What he Absolutely. believes in. Unbelievable.